The Cartoonrific Podcast is sponsored by the Wonderful World of Animation Gallery, home of rare and wonderful fine animation art. Visit their website at www.gallery.com. And for our Cartoonrific listeners, you will receive a special 10% discount off any purchase if you purchase by March 25th, 2024. Just go to www.gallery.com and enter code CARTOON10 for your 10% discount. Once again, this discount is only valid until midnight, March 25th, 2024. Once again, visit www.gallery.com. The following is a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. It's Cartoonerific. 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 It's Cartoonerific. Cartoonerific. With your host, Brian Mitchell. Well, howdy, partners, and welcome to the Cartoonerific Podcast, Classic Animated Cartoons. I'm your host, Brian Mitchell. Thank you for coming back. We have a a delightful show today, and I don't use delightful too often, but uh, it seemed fitting here. Uh, When I was growing up in the 60s, when I was a toddler uh, watching all these cartoons and and being mesmerized, in the late 60s, all of a sudden there was a new show that came on, and uh, NBC premiered it. It was a cartoon show about a panther, and it had uh, this weird guy that was an inspector, so featured uh, some cartoons about a little ant and an aardvark that was trying to eat him. They were nothing like I'd ever seen before. I mean, I'd seen bold cartoons before, but this was interesting because the designs were really bold and the colors were bright and it had fresh music. It wasn't the typical cartoony music that you would hear on a Tom and Jerry cartoon or a Disney or a a Walter Lance or a Looney Tunes cartoon. It didn't have the big band sound, but it had a jazzy sound uh, and there were interesting themes Uh, Very different from the typical cartoon. Being so different and fresh and new and even funny, these cartoons totally mesmerized me as the show went from its half-hour season to the next season where it was expanded to an hour, and then the following year to an hour and a half. Uh, So I ended up watching those cartoons and absolutely loving them. And I knew they weren't full animation, kid at nine or 10 years old. I didn't really pick up on why they kind of looked the way they looked or whatever, but they were thoroughly enjoyable. Those were the cartoons produced by a studio called De Patty Freeling. And the cartoons we're talking about are the Pink Panthers and the Ant and the Aardvark and the Inspector and the Tijuana Toads, aka the Texas Toads, and, and many, many more. Uh, They were very interesting cartoons. They've been put out over the years by MGM. MGM basically uh, owns those cartoons along with uh, a couple other people. But um, Kino Lorber acquired all those cartoons for release, and basically uh, they put them out on disc. They put them out on DVD and Blu-ray, lovingly restoring these cartoons and putting them out, which is terrific. Our guest actually did some commentary on these DVDs and Blu-rays. He's the author of Think Pink, the story of the DePatty Freeling Studio. That is Mr. Mark Arnold. And he is our guest for today. He's coming up next. Don't go away. Cartoonerific is the place to be to celebrate hand-drawn animated cartoons. The Cartoonerific podcast features interviews with the magic makers behind your favorite animated cartoons with episodes uploaded every Friday. Or visit the Cartoonerific blog featuring articles about classic cartoon animation. At the Cartoonerific gallery, view original animation art and memorabilia from your favorite animated films and TV shows. 
The company store features exclusive swag from the cartoonerific universe. And coming soon, brand new world premiere cartoons on the Cartoonerific channel. It's all here. Join the fun at www.cartoonerific.com. That's cartoon, E R I F I C.com. It's Cartoonerific, saving the universe one funny cartoon at a time. And now it's time for our special Cartoonerific guest. Well, welcome back. Uh, we have on a special guest today. He's an author. He's written a bunch of books on pop culture, but mostly on animated cartoons, books that I never would ever think that anybody would write about. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It, it's just that uh, uh, some of these some of these subjects are um, are not not in the mainstream. Um, so uh, Mr. Arnold has written books on uh, Harvey Comics. Total Television Cartoons, which includes Underdog, and uh, of course I go blank right now, Tennessee Tuxedo, and and uh, a bunch of others. He wrote a book on Alvin, the story of Ross Bagdasarian Sr., and uh, a book that I just saw, Frozen and Ice, the story of Walt Disney Productions from 1966 to 1985. Please welcome author Mark Arnold. Hey, Mark, Hello. how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I, I know that introduction didn't sound so marvelous, but I'll, I'll sweeten it up in post, and I'll uh, I'll add some applause and all that other wonderful stuff. Right, so, <laughs> so uh, part of the reason why I wanted to have you on, we're, we're talking about Think Pink, which is your book about the story of the Patty Freeling uh, Enterprises, and um, I'm you know some people don't like those cartoons because they seem like they are. Um, kind of a ripoff of the Warner Brothers cartoons because basically it's all the same people and they, and, and they do reuse a lot of stories, but they did a lot of fresh material as well. And I happen to really like those cartoons. I think they're um, the first cartoon that came out from them won, uh, won an Academy Award and uh, that was a, a Pink Panther cartoon. So yes. they definitely, you know, uh, uh, Frizz Freeling and... Uh, Holly Pratt and John Dunn and the people that were there, uh, Art Leonardi, uh, they, they made a terrific team. Can you, can you tell us how the Patty Freeling started? It started from the remnants of the the old Warner Brothers cartoon studio, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, basically, you know, the, the whole Warner Brothers animation studio had a number of different leaders, and I'm not totally versed on who was who over the years. I mean, it's Termite Terrace, as you may have heard over the years on the Warner Brothers a lot in Burbank. And um, the last uh, head of the studio for that division was David DePatty. And uh, unfortunately, he got the mandate saying, well, we've done enough cartoons let's wrap it up basically and uh so um chuck jones had already left because it was kind of winding down anyway and um it was just slowly running down like i said uh and so he consulted with the one animation director he really liked and was a buddy with which was frizz freeling and just invited him and said, hey, um, this is closing down. What do you say you and I pool our resources and we'll start our own studio? And Frizz hemmed and hawed for a bit. And even Frizz uh, left for a bit before this happened and worked briefly for Hanna-Barbera on the feature, Hey There, It's Yogi Bear. So it wasn't like a real cut and dried story. In fact, if you read in the book, um, a lot of this stuff overlaps. It wasn't like one day we're Warner Brothers and now we're to Patty Freeling. It's like things were kind of sloshing over. <laughs> trying to trying to figure out where they're going. I think the same thing right. happened over at Hanna-Barbera when they were leaving MGM. And I think mm -hmm. there was a whole deal with Bill Hanna and Michael Law and maybe somebody else involved to do mm -hmm. commercials and stuff. Or, or I think it was Crusader Rabbit, actually. I think that had something to do with it. But... Um, but then uh, they were linked up with George Sidney, and then George Sidney mm -hmm. said, well, you need this other guy. You need Joe. Keep the team together and then uh, create right. a new production company. But yeah. however it happens, it happens, you know. Yeah. Um, so when they, they finally they shook hands on this thing, yeah. the big mystery, we've been talking about this actually 
I uh, so I said in uh, a previous this the podcast that's on this uh, this past week <clears throat> that the way the story that I heard was that they got the studio for free because uh, De Patty was basically you know it he had he had a relative in upper management so. Yes. So they basically just said, look, you know, we'll help you get started. Just, you know, just use the studio facility. Then I heard another story that to make it legal, it was like a dollar a year. Do you have the actual scoop on this, correct? Yeah. 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 So what, what it's actually, a li- what it's actually a little happened? Bit of both. And yeah, yeah. It, it was like some handshake deal. And yeah, to make it legal, they had to do it like a dollar a year. But essentially, it was the same studio, but now they were using it for free on uh, you know on the warner brothers lot for outside productions so yeah so basically uh, it was uh it was all this equipment uh, they had yeah. they had the cameras which animation cameras back in that day were like first of all they were rare and if you wanted one that shot 35 millimeter film you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars for an animation camera yeah. um and so you know the the fact that they got the studio's turnkey operation, <laughs> basically, they didn't even have to move their butts out of their chairs, really. They could have just, yeah. you know. And I mean, it's really kind of strange because uh, DePatty and Freeling just really lucked out. And Warner Brothers really made what I consider kind of a critical error. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah but, just like at MGM, you know, 10 yeah. years before that, or not 10 years, five years before that, six years. Uh, yeah. Because they did the same thing. And then all of a sudden they realized, oh, wait, these things actually make us money. Yeah. Right. And that's but what the, happened. The prevailing thinking was, of course, the TV was taking over and theatrical cartoons were done. And they solidified that by making the Bugs Bunny show originally as a primetime series. And they figured, eh, you know, we don't need to do any more cartoons. We'll just show that. And uh, um, the last projects they were working on were just a few you know typical you know looney tunes and a couple specials and things like that and the very last thing was the uh in, the animation for the incredible mr limpet that don knotts that's feature. right yeah and they they didn't even use their own people i think they brought in uh <laughs> bill Titla from new york right bill Titla had been living in new york so he went out to work on this thing and all the time he's he was trying to get back at disney but um <laughs> But then you had, I think, other Disney animators working on it too, right? I mean, yeah. uh, Abe, did Abe Levito work on that? I, I mean, I don't even I think know. so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think you're correct on that, but I'm not positive on it. Um, but yeah, that's what they ended with on the original Warner Brothers studio. And then what uh, DePetty Freeling started with, basically, uh, Warner Brothers had some ad contracts already in place. And uh, they continued on with those and did uh, more animated commercials for things like um, Gillette Razor and uh, Starkus Tuna with Charlie the Tuna and things like that. And then as time went on, they graduated from just doing those, you know, commercial spots to doing titles for movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they were doing okay, but they weren't doing, they weren't, being terribly successful at it but you know they just keep plugging away and just doing projects and kept them busy and stuff like that right. um and then i don't know if you're going to ask the question but then when did those <laughs> things when did their fortunes turn well of course you know they started doing titles for movies and things like that but the one title that everybody knows now that uh was the one that changed all their fortunes was doing the titles for blake edwards pink panther film he just had a live action picture and he said hmm this might be good to have some animated titles you know and he wasn't even thinking about making an actual pink panther character he just said eh, just make some titles for my film right but they still had history they still had to create the character and i think holly Holly pratt which uh uh, i was talking with willie ito about this uh earlier was saying he doesn't seem to get that much uh i guess People don't really mention that name too well. You know, you always hear the no, same people no. over and over and over again. Chuck Jones, you'll hear Frizz Freeling, Mel Blanc, and then, you know, Disney, you know, uh, now it's uh, um, 
oh god andreas deja and glenn right. Keane and people like that you hear about right. all those people but you never hear about holly pratt who was a, a brilliant artist and he was a, a good director he was a really good director right um from what i know and from you know interviewing other people for the book um uh i scoured and looked everywhere and consulted everyone to see if there was like an interview somewhere in print or audio or something with Holly Pratt. And the only thing I got out of people is like, Oh yeah, I talked to Holly Pratt, but I never really thought about recording it, you know? And uh, all they just basically said, he was a very nice man and he was very soft spoken. And I think that's a lot to do with it is he didn't, go out of his way to say hey i created pink panther it was my deal you know he just it was just something he did and you know he was he directed some of the shorts he directed other things and you know just went on with his life he wasn't a big grandstander about his own uh achievements so. yeah i guess some some of those guys just considered it a job and it wasn't like they were gonna go out there and you know kind of tout their successes you know yeah. um when they when Warner Brothers shut down, they basically they had the pick of the litter of the people in that studio to yeah. to take on. So Hawley was one of them. I think mm -hmm. Art Leonardi was. I don't, uh, I, I don't know if he left the studio and then came back. I mean, he did very briefly. In fact, everybody left. There was you know just a little slim window, and uh, basically. I don't know if I can swear on here or not, but you know, I could uh, clean it up for you know, or you can bleep or whatever. You yeah. know, apparently you got a I'll put some cartoon the... sound effects over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently uh Art Leonardi got a telegram that said, get your ass back here. Because <laughs> uh... <laughs> he was starting to work on other projects, doing storyboarding and uh other commercial projects that had nothing to do with Warner Brothers, nothing to do with the Patty Freeling. And uh he was just uh, moving on to his other part of his career. And I think he actually had moved from California to New York, where yeah, you are, right? and was going to go do the next chapter of his life. He wasn't looking backwards. And that's when DePatty, I'm sure it was for his freeling, said, we need him, you know, and, and a few others. Mm -hmm. And he basically rehired his entire unit and uh, the entirety of uh, Bob McKimson's old unit. And uh, right. pretty much everyone from Chuck Jones's unit that was available, a lot of people stayed with Chuck Jones, but, you know, anybody who was available mm -hmm. that, you know, would be willing to work, that worked with old Warner Brothers, yeah, they, they tried to bring back in. They got a lot of them. Right. So. Wow. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, it, like I said, it's a, a turnkey studio, really, because mm -hmm. these people are out and, you know, all I had to do is just call them up, ring them up on the phone. And that was it, you know? Yeah. So, and... um, so anyway, when, 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 okay. So we know when the fortune started to turn with that, but what happened? Okay. They, they did the titles. They, they, uh, the titles went over pretty, pretty darn well. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the film came out and there were certain reviewers that actually liked the titles over the feature film. And I heard, uh, I'm not sure if this is true. I heard that basically people wanted to see the titles again in the mm -hmm. theaters. Is that, is that true? Or I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard that maybe from, yeah. Different variety of reviewers, uh, different, I mean, variety of the publication reviewer uh, reviews and stuff like that, that I've seen different things. I did a lot of research on different, um, old publications like that and yeah there was uh you know uh different differing reports that yeah people really enjoyed those titles they thought they're really funny and clever mm -hmm. and yeah you know, there wasn't really a talk initially to make it a series or anything but then once the the, the word and the buzz about it came about why not you know and yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure the uh, the people that produced it was it the Marish brothers or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I don't yeah. know if it was brothers or whatever, but the Marish yeah. group, and then you had yeah. uh, Blake Edwards and all that. I'm sure that they heard over and over again. You know, wow, those those titles for that movie was excellent. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure when they heard it often enough that it just became a no brainer for them. Yeah. And, uh, well, the, the wheels started spinning for all of them, especially uh, DePatty and Freeling, because they both realized that they could actually own one of these characters instead of doing a Bugs Bunny that was owned by Warner Brothers or mm -hmm. any other character. You know, that's like, wow, this is a character. They didn't own 100% of it because, of course, Blake Edwards owned part of it, the Mirish Brothers owned part of it, but still mm -hmm. they owned 
some of it, which, you know, with any of the Looney Tunes, they didn't own any of it. So some is better than none. So yeah, there you go. And they were collecting a paycheck on top of that. So exactly. So, so uh, do you, you know what exactly happened? Did they, they approached, uh, they approached Frizz and, uh, and to Patty and, uh, <laughs> What, I think it was more the Patty and Freeling thought it up, saying we need to do more with this. Like um, Blake Edwards, he's a filmmaker. He wasn't really thinking about uh, making his titles into starring characters of shorts. Right <laughs> now, he's going to, of course, reap the benefits of it because you know that was his film. But you know, he was going on to direct things like uh, The Great Race and you know other things that had nothing to do with Pink Panther. So yeah, and he, he did one more Pink Panther film, which was Shot in the Dark, which actually didn't have the Pink Panther in it. Right, and uh, but that was the with Inspector. the Clouseau character, right? Yeah, it did have the Inspector yeah. in it, at least yeah. an earlier version of it. But we'll talk about that later, I guess. But you right. know, it wasn't another decade before he did another pink panther film that actually had the character yeah i think it was 74 (laughs) maybe 74 that he did it yeah yeah yeah. so i mean but you know like i said he was reaping the rewards of having (laughs) being a part owner but uh he didn't really care at least from what i researched whether it made it into a series of cartoons or not it was mainly um to patty and freeling because they wanted to keep their studio float they want you know and they go hey we could do this with a starring character right and so who um, get, who so where did the deal come from because i know they they got some sweetheart deal to yeah. produce all these shorts it was like a 10-year deal maybe to produce theatricals yeah was that the deal interestingly enough and this is the weird part about the story and i don't really have it cl- crystal clear as to why warner brothers but there was they they had no interest in this even though they're and of course even though the patty and freeling were on the warner brothers lot yeah uh they were free agents so they could do whatever they wanted mm-hmm. so i think basically what they did is they put the word out to all these different studios and of all the ones that decided to grab it was United Artists who never really had a theatrical series. I think that they uh, distributed Disney films way, 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 way back. Way back when it was something like Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford. Exactly. (laughs) So they were probably chomping at the bit to say, Hey, let's do this. And um, I can't remember. I have to read my own book. I can't remember if it was before (laughs) Or after the first Pink Panther cartoon, but the first one is the Pink Fink. Right. It won an Oscar, mm-hmm. which is amazing. Just right out the gate, the very first cartoon you make yeah. is, is an Oscar winner. So I don't know if it was before or after, but I, I'm kind of thinking it was directly after. They probably were commissioned to do one. Oh, I know why it was United Artists, because the Pink Panther film, of course. The, the Pink Panther film was United Artists, so they gave them the first option right. to do a right. series from it. But um, also, uh, that uh, mandate, and I've heard differing amounts, and you'll see it in the book. It was like either 100 cartoons, 110 cartoons, 125 cartoons, 150 cartoons. Who knows the exact amount, but it's somewhere between 150. 150 cartoons needed to be made over the next seven years from Patty Freeling Mm -hmm. starring Pink Panther or possibly other characters should they emerge. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. So they came up with the inspector was the next one because that was the logical one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then they came up with these two other characters, the ant and the aardvark, which came out of absolutely nowhere. Uh, (laughs) Probably out of the, the demented mind of John Dunn. Yeah. And yeah. uh and and stuck him with the voices of uh I think it was Dean Martin, right? And yeah, uh J- Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason. Did. Sorry. It's it you know, it kind of sounds like uh it could be Dean Martin. As well, the, Dean Martin was the ant. The ant and yeah. then Jackie now, granted, Mason. Right. Yeah, you know, that's an imitation. I think there was yeah. a couple cartoons that actually had uh Jackie Mason, but it was really John Biner who did the bulk of it. Right. Um and so he was doing a Jackie Mason imitation and a Dean Martin imitation. Wow. And uh it was Jackie Mason's like, hey, you can't use my voice. And so they said, All right, come and do your own voice. And right. basically said, hmm, this is a lot more work than I thought. So he said, uh, eh, Biner can do my voice. You could just pay me a little royalty. And so that's what they did. That's what they did. Wow. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. Did Dean Martin get a, a royalty out of that too? Or no, he never he never he probably never realized. <laughs> he did he probably didn't care, you know. And, you know, but Dean Martin is like 
you know, whereas Mason was popular, but you know, I'm sure yeah. he never made the income Dean Martin did. So oh, he's you know, playing he's comedy like, clubs, yeah, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, yeah, but that's... And then a couple other theatricals that we're mentioning ones that came around roughly around the same time, but aren't as well known as they did, um, Roland and rat Fink, yes. which is kind of like a, uh, good guy versus bad guy type, uh, like an old melodrama type thing, you know, mm-hmm. right. um, and those were a definite John Dunn type creation too. And, you know, they're very creative. There's some that are done completely like the characters are done just whitewashed. It's just white. There's no color in their uh, anything except on the backgrounds or something. It's just. I, I believe, and just knowing animation, knowing ink and paint a little bit, mm-hmm. that uh, they probably did that to save time. You oh, know, I'm sure they did. Uh, it, it gives it a very different style too to do something. Well, like it's that. a very graphic look, and uh, yeah. you know, you paint the ant all red except for maybe the eyes, you know, and then right. uh, and then the aardvark is blue. Yeah, and um, Pink Panther is pink, and I. <laughs> and, well, I think they did yeah. that. Yeah, it's yeah. like uh, once Pink Panther hit, they they learned from this, saying, "Let's make very simple shapes or simple colors." simple mm-hmm. ideas you know um one of their other ones i was going to mention is tijuana toads oh so just yeah two green toads later known as texas toads on television but it was essentially the same show to, to um, be politically correct they dubbed yeah. them didn't they they dubbed those characters yeah but it, it, the interesting thing is it was the same actors redubbing their own voices they just didn't put the accent on it. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> They're, so. they're, they're actually very funny cartoons. I found the uh, Texas Toads uh, with, uh, what is it, Crazy Legs Crane? Yeah. They, they spun him off, which... Yeah, that was a later, later one. And, which they yeah. probably shouldn't have spun him off, but he's right. yellow. Yeah, he was actually funnier when he was just a supporting character instead of a starring character. Exactly. You know? <laughs> no, he's not a starring character. They should have realized that, but I think they felt that, man, ah, we got to do something. Yeah. So, but... Um, there's a, a show called Here Comes the Grump that they did for TV, which was yeah. uh, basically it's Yosemite Sam in a grump outfit. This right. uh, troll, he's kind of like a troll like character. And then you have the princess. And, yeah, uh, basically, it's a combination of Yosemite Sam cartoon and the Wizard of Oz or something to that effect. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's like exactly. With princesses and princesses and other things kind of thrown into the, to the mix but i mean you, uh it seems like each time they go to some crazy land like the, there's an episode where they go to like a balloon land where all the characters of balloons you know <laughs> things like that so um but that one was made for television but strangely enough i mean just as an aside uh in foreign markets that cartoon was wildly successful and in the last three or four years an independent studio made a cgi version of here comes the grump it's not called here comes the grump i think it's called a wizard's tale or something i mean you can Uh, find it on dvd right (laughs) but (laughs) you know just it's still a de patty freeling in name only production because they Mm -hmm. created the characters but still it's kind of bizarre that that would have any sort of staying power (laughs) that's true yeah de patty freeling seemed to be i mean aside from the warner brothers people that came across like bob mckimson and uh, i'm trying to think of some of the story people, because I don't think they used John Dunn was a Warner Brothers story guy that actually took over for, I think, when Maltese left Mm -hmm. and he was on Chuck Jones. I think he was fashioning stories for all the units over there at Warner Brothers. Wasn't that, isn't that correct? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Because uh, Walter Foster left and he went to Hanna-Barbera to make serious dough over there. And And inside Mike Mike Maltese. Maltese. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So they left, and then John Dunn was basically the story guy for yeah. all those cartoons. And then basically when they closed down, John Dunn was – he was worth a lot, and he knew he was worth a lot. But, yeah. And and from from what I understand, he was always looking for that raise. He was always looking for <laughs> yeah. that that grand promotion, which never came. But, I mean, yeah. he was he was kind of the story guy for, for De Patty yeah. Frilling for 20 years. But there's a few other people that came into their own, like Gary Shinicky. He did a few, uh, directed quite a few cartoons. And, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Cornelius or Corny Cole, he did some designs, especially for some of their TV specials, and like the Flip, Flip Wilson specials, the comedian. Uh, um, I, did two, I, I saw them when they originally came out. Yeah. So, I don't remember yeah, them. It's a very but... sketchy look 
you know design luck and stuff like that um yeah um and you know there's uh, like warren bachelor is a person that came from the old warren brothers days that you right. know helped a lot um laverne harding came from i guess she joined later on she was from walter lance i guess when they shut down she she jumped ship well yeah. not jumped ship she just yeah moved over but <laughs> yeah. uh yeah well, i mean during the course of the 60s i mean uh Paramount kept making cartoons until like 1967. I think Terry Toons lasted around the same time, and then uh, or like 69. Yeah, and Walter they were Lance, both they were both here in New York. Yeah, yeah. Walter Lance lasted till 72, and um, Hanna Barbera dipped into doing theatricals with a series called Loopy De Loop, but then they just gave it up after that. So really. The Patty Freeling was it after that, and they actually kept theatricals up until 1981, which is amazing to me. But <laughs> it, it is, but you could see, like at the end, they're kind of sputtering out. Um, oh yeah. yeah, but they they made some very funny cartoons back in the 60s mm -hmm. and early 70s. Yeah, um, yeah. and so they still, you know, they had some spark there. The um, Bob McKimson uh, ended up becoming one of the directors. Who were the other directors over there? Do you know? I mean, well, like uh, I said, Gary Shinicky did a lot of them. Even right. Art Leonardi directed a few. Uh, Holly Pratt directed a few. Mm -hmm. um, May, uh, Frizz Freeling did some of his final directing efforts. He tended to direct like the first cartoon of any particular series. To set, and then, it, to set it in yeah, stone. Yeah. yeah, and then once that's done, he just handed it off to everyone else. Um, there is, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name, but uh, you know, a later series called Blue Racer that actually... At that point, some of the productions, because doing 150 cartoons is a lot in mm -hmm. a short period of time. So they actually had to farm out some of the productions. And so they uh, farmed out the production to Spain on the Blue Blue Racer. And some of those were directed out of there. And wow. they basically animated it and did everything overseas and then sent it back. Right. Uh, you know, um, did, and, it, did, it uh, still, did it still look like a uh, the Patty Freeling product? Yeah, in general, they kept the style pretty good, but there are some strange cartoons that came out. Yeah, uh, some that don't make any sense whatsoever. But you know, it, it, it's it's really weird. Uh, I mean, fortunately now you can see them all because in the last few years, and I had the privilege of doing the commentaries on these. Uh, Kino Lorber got the rights to release all the theatrical. Uh, to Patty Freeling cartoons and so right slowly over time I was working with Greg Ford on this right and uh, we'd say well he'd call me up and he'd say well we got to do Roland the Ratfink now okay well I'll watch all the cartoons and you know uh, mm -hmm. which ones do you want to do commentaries on well I like this and this one well, Jerry Beck's doing commentary on that well I tried to not do the same ones and so we have different commentaries on them right and it was fun to do the the hardest one to do was the last one, which actually wasn't done last, but it was the last one to Patty Freeling did, The Crazy Legs Crane. I mean, it got to the point where if you listen to the DVD commentaries, even Jerry Beck says, I have nothing more to say about this cartoon. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was painful. I, they were uh, wrapping up you know productions and everything by that point i mean we could talk about that later but you know it's right. like um and then the ones we haven't mentioned yet theatrical besides blue racers uh hoot clute which is like this mm -hmm. uh cowboy uh character with his little horse sidekick and um and then the dog father which of course was a quickie cash in on the godfather so you know but was with that, dogs was that a series or that was just a... that was a theatrical series yeah oh god and, and wow. you mentioned earlier you said you know they started ripping off things dog father is one where i think they did a lot of these they did 17 cartoons that was like the magic number that they had to do yeah uh and dog father i think half of them or a little over half of them are total reused warner brothers scripts oh now, sure uh, i haven't mentioned in the book which ones are which and stuff like that but it, the, it's the ones where you know they have like the big bulldog and the little uh yippy dog that's like oh you're big and strong and la 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 and then they just redid it with different dogs and right there's your dog father cartoon <laughs> there you go just use that you know i could just see for saying just use that cartoon yeah just just rip it and, and change it a little you know it's interesting to watch them i mean had they not not done the original cartoon like had they just done the dog father cartoons and they weren't remakes mm -hmm. they're not that bad at cartoons but the unfortunate thing is you get all the looney tunes that you can compare it to and it's like 
this was done way better back in the 50s. Sure. <laughs> so. Well, they had they had more money. What was the uh, average budget, do you know, of uh mm, I think it varied over the years. I, I you know, it seems like 100,000 kind of, you know, per cartoons kind of sticks in my head, but I could be totally off on that. Yeah. I have balance sheets and things like that in the book. So again, I don't right. have it all memorized. I think maybe <laughs> later on they were probably there because I think um Yeah. Like a, a Flintstones, ju- the cartoon, the series costs yeah. uh, probably between forty and sixty five thousand, sixty six thousand at the time. Yeah. So I'm sure the budgets for these cartoons were probably, you know, if right. you're using that as a, a guide, at least I, I think maybe a third that for each yeah. cartoon. But, but I will say this: I, I don't know exact dollar amounts. I'll say that, but right. I do know that uh, it, there was like different tiers so um most of the tv animation that was just episodic tv that was probably like the the lowest budgets right uh, that they had yeah um then the next level up were the uh um theatricals that they leased out because they did lease out some theatricals of roadrunner uh, two back to Warner Brothers. Right. Strangely enough, okay. later on. So when did a very low budget for theatrical? When you know. when did the Warners realize? Uh, you know, okay, they they closed down the animation department. The Patty Freeling are in the the studio. They're renting it, yeah. or whatever. And oh. then uh, and then all of a sudden, it's like some executive at Warner Brothers goes, oh, you know, we need more of these cartoons. They're yeah. actually doing pretty well. It was pretty quick. It was probably about a year. But I think what's, you know, solidified it was uh, Pink Fink winning the Oscar. They said, hey, there's money to be made in these theatrical cartoons. But um, So they struck a deal with them to do more Looney Tunes. Yeah. And uh, I think they did some Roadrunners, right? Yeah. And Rudy, they did all Roadrunners, but they... Uh, yeah. Rudy LaRiva, the, I think, he, was one... Yeah, he was the person I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, they did, uh, I think... I forgive me if I don't remember the exact numbers, like 14 or something between right. 1964 and 1967. Uh, so they were de- considered to Patty Freeling cartoons. Uh, Chris Freeling didn't want to have anything to do with them for two reasons. One is they weren't his characters anymore, or right. they weren't his characters to begin with. Right. And also, yeah, he never worked on the Roadrunners back in the day. I mean, it's like these weren't his cartoons. He didn't care. Right. So that's why he sublet them out to format films who mm-hmm. did the alvin show uh, you know, ross bagbasarian's thing yeah and uh also uh later they did a lone ranger series so you know that was their big theatrical claim to fame as form for format films is doing those roadrunners that most people don't like <laughs> so. yeah i mean there's one that's really horrible called uh run run sweet roadrunner yeah. and i know about this cartoon because yeah. When I was a kid, I had a 16 millimeter projector and I would buy whatever cartoons and I couldn't get any Looney Tunes. And then somebody had, oh, yeah, I got this Roadrunner cartoon you might be interested in. And I was like, oh, cool. And I didn't know. I, I don't think there was a book on the titles and uh, who produced what. I don't think there was. Right. You know, I was like, it was, you know, back in the 70s. So I, I bought this cartoon for like 30 bucks <laughs> and I run it and I'm like, it's not a Chuck Jones cartoon, you know. I knew yeah. I knew enough that Chuck Jones did the Road Runner, and then yeah. it was just basically this uh, Drek. It had three gags in the cartoon, yeah. <laughs> and where Road Runner cartoon would have ten gags, but I mean it was three bad gags, yeah. and then you know. But uh, yeah, so is that all they did? I mean, I know they did. I'm, I'm not sure if they did it or if it was when Warner Brothers reformed. They the did a few studio. of the Daffy Duck, Speedy Gonzalez ones. Too. Yeah, that was a terrific so, combination. Yeah, <laughs> and how that came about was basically somebody at Warner Brothers, typical executive that's not interested in creativity or animation, looked at the balance sheets and uh, tried to figure out who are the most popular characters worldwide. And apparently Daffy Duck and Speedy Gonzalez fit the bill. There you they go. Said, Let's do cartoons with them. I don't know why Bugs Bunny wouldn't have made the list, but I think there is always, after the original Warner Brothers studio, until it reopened again, there is always an issue with Bugs Bunny that I'm not totally clear on because I wasn't researching that part for my book. Right. Somebody else like a Jerry Beck could probably, you know, 
figure that out. He was probably as typical as something. It's just like the Marvel superheroes. You got these superheroes at this studio. You got this one over here. So Bugs Bunny was too busy shilling Tang or something like that that he couldn't be starring in theatrical cartoons or something like that. You know, <laughs> it's uh, like, that, yeah. that's possible. But they may have viewed yeah. it as uh, they may have viewed Bugs as the gem, and they didn't want to like tamper with that and they figured they could screw sure. around with the other characters yeah dabby yeah. duck well he's had two personalities so we, we can mess with him <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's that's an interesting concept daffy <laughs> with multiple he does have multiple personalities yeah. through different directors yeah. right yeah. so to, to wrap up the warner brothers part of the story just you know for the sake of argument it's like so in 67 warner brothers said this is really a really odd situation where we're giving to patty freeling the 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 work and then they're subleasing it out to format films so at that point they brought everything back in mm -hmm. but also in doing that they ended the speedy gonzalez daffy duck cartoons and they also ended uh the the road runner ones and they did like merle and the magic mouse and cool cat and all those weird ones at the end but yeah hey there there were considered warner brothers cartoons again and yeah. they got mckimson back as a director and stuff like that but and uh you know in the meantime to patty freeling was uh still doing their theatricals and then they uh NBC approached them and they wanted to do Pink Panther on television and mm -hmm. uh, to Patty and Freeling pushed them off as far as they could, right. which was five years. And so they said, well, can you come up with something else that we can put on TV? And uh, that's their first series was the Super Six. Yes. Which is that, and actually, that's totally John Dunn. That is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not bad for a TV series. Right. You know, it's like uh and then they did um like a dr do little series and you know they slowly rolled them out but then by the 70s mm -hmm. they were they were never the the level of Hanna barbera where they had like eight series on no time. no they were never but as big they always had like one or two series each season right. all the way up until they closed in 1980 so well, well they were still um, they were doing commercials they're busy doing yeah, commercials they're doing yeah. an occasional special yeah. Um, and that was what I didn't finish that thought, too. Yeah. It's like so the different tiers, you had those theatricals. And then the next tier up was, you know, those specials. And, and they got big dollars for doing like all those Dr. Seuss specials and sure. things like that. So right. um, and of course, they continued on doing, you know, titles for different TV shows like I Dream a Teenie and stuff like that. Yeah. So Patty Freeland was really busy, especially in the 60s, well, in the 70s, quite a bit, too. You know, sure. they shifted more towards TV uh, because that's where the money went. So you know. I think what's interesting is, you know, Chuck Chuck Jones did the, the Grinch special, mm -hmm. which was excellent, brilliant special. And he did another Sue special, which I think it was Horton. Horton, here's a who. Yeah. Yeah. And then he got no more Dr. Seuss stuff. And I think there was a, uh, I think there was some sort of a, a riff between uh, uh, Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss and Chuck Jones. Yeah. Cause he, I, I know, I know he was always miffed over the fact that he said the Grinch, how the Grinch stole Christmas is Chuck Jones version of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> right. And I think, that eyelashes yeah <laughs> big and, punchy eyebrows and everything <laughs> and i wonder i wonder if that's why those specials ended up going to the patty freeling because uh maybe they were a little bit more faithful to what uh what dr seuss or or geisel was doing i don't know i think that was part of it also um there might have been financial situations because i know uh chuck jones had a little brief period around that time early 70s where you know he was producing stuff for shows like curiosity shop and stuff like that but he wasn't doing as much as he was you know he wasn't he was doing like uh, uh you know he did the theatrical phantom toll booth he did uh those tom and jerry mgm cartoons so he was pretty busy in the 60s and then as the 60s ended into the 70s you know yeah, but you know there is kind of an overlap that you you haven't that is discussed in the book. So, um, as much as Ted and Chuck might have had friction, uh, Chuck did work on the first Patty Freeling one, which was uh, Cat in the Hat. 
So, oh. um, but that was the last one that Chuck worked on. So, well, maybe um, he maybe he started it, and maybe it was pulled, yeah, and maybe, yeah, maybe for his, so for his um, it has a little it. twinge of it, but it it definitely looks like a Patty Freeling production. But it you know it, it has a little Chuck. You you can kind of see Chuck Jones' fingerprints on it a little bit, you know, when you watch that one compared to later cat in the hat specials that the patty freeling did them by themselves so. they did yeah the grinch grinch is the uh, the cat in the hat or something yeah like things that. like that yeah. yeah or even so. uh dr seuss on the loose which has three stories and cat in the hat makes a brief appearance in that so that's right so it's, yeah that's right i think uh just uh one more thing to add with chuck jones is he, he did the pogo special yeah. which i don't think it's been seen since it was made no. Uh, I don't think I've seen it, or if I did see it, I saw it when I was like three when it aired. <laughs> I remember <And> so <laughs> there was some film magazine, or some film fan monthly thing, or uh, a, a film collector's magazine back in the seventies, where somebody had pogo cells. They had like stacks of pogo cells that they were selling for like twenty bucks a piece, and yeah. uh, yes, from the Chuck Jones thing. So yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, I haven't seen the special and. Uh, no. Uh, maybe maybe a bit of it. I, I, it. It's not the greatest, and I think. Right. It, but anyway. But as the seventies wore on, uh, Chuck Jones did kind of make a comeback before working for Looney Tunes again, uh, because he did a bunch of a series of TV specials, like Mowgli's Brothers, and I can't think of the Cricket at Times, Cricket in uh, Times Square, Square. yeah, you know, things like that. So yeah. you know, he did a few others that kind of, you know, put him back on the map as, hey, you know, I can direct things. Yeah, you know, so. I, I just kind of figured he had a little lull period and Dr. Seuss figured I'll go with a more established studio for the rest of my cartoons, which he did until mm-hmm. the Batty Freeling folded. And then he did a few more later with other animation companies. So Yeah. Maybe Hanna-Barbera or something. I don't, yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember. I haven't kept track of that stuff. Um, the one series that I remember from the Patty Freeling, the oddball couple. Yes. Once once again, a uh, it's a cat and a dog, right? Uh, playing. I actually the- like that series. <laughs> I thought of their later series. Uh, you know, as you go into the seventies, you know, Oddball is a good descriptor for what uh, DeFatty Freeling would tend to do on Saturday mornings because right. they went all over the map. Uh, yeah, Oddball Couple obviously is uh, a riff on the Odd Couple, mm-hmm. and uh, but it's a TV version, so there's no. Um, uh, Jack Klugman or Tony Randall or Walter Matthau or Jack Lemon. You know, it's it's, right. it's uh, Frank Nelson is spiffy and uh, I forgot who, uh, oh, Paul Winchell is uh, what's the name of the dog? I can't remember the dog on the show. Right. I should know these characters. Right. But, you know, it, it's actually not a bad show and it did finally come out on DVD. Um, but that was the wave of what was going on in the 70s. I mean, Hanna-Barbera did like every tv show under the sun and so did filmation you know it was like oh there's gilligan's island tv show let's make a gilligan's island cartoon right. oh there's an i dream a genie tv show let's make an i dream a genie lost cartoon. in space partridge yeah. family it all became yeah, yeah. brady bunch so you know, they just you know, threw them in outer really space had their foot in it too <laughs> you know and it's like uh, literally uh, right. um but they did some weird ones that you know i didn't even know until i did the book i go that was a DePatty Freeling. Um, they did a version of Planet of the Apes. Oh, and wow. it's done with Doug Wildey, who helped do the uh, Johnny Quest show. Mm-hmm. And it looks like a Johnny Quest show, you know, and it, it's very serious. And you, I could have sworn up and down because I saw it when I was a kid. I could have sworn up and down it was done by Hanna Barbera Filmation. It wasn't done by DePatty Freeling. Right. They do the funny animal stuff. They don't do this serious stuff. Yeah. And there it is, you know. So Yeah, well, I guess they, they felt they had a change to uh, to kind of keep the work coming in. Yeah. They also yeah. did some inter- interstitial uh stuff, I think, for ABC, which yeah. was this weird kind of Yeah, well they they did these uh TV specials. There's the the all encompassing ABC after school special uh, title, and most of those were live action. But Hanna Barbera did a few of them for that series, and uh, De Patty Freeling did a few. And one's called uh, Little Red and the Magical Mystery Machine or something. It's a long title like that, mm-hmm. and it it introduced this kind of weird looking character with a top hat called Timer, 
And that's, uh, the, that's what I was talking about. Um, yeah. You know, later on, they said, since this guy's semi-educational, let's let's uh, animate a few more spots just to kind of fill in the gaps between cartoons. It's kind of like Schoolhouse Rock does, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you always have to get that education quotient. So you had things like in the news, which is a news report for kids. And then you had the Schoolhouse Rock, which did teach you about grammar or multiplication or about the history of America or something. And then uh, Time for Timer would come in there and he'd teach you about nutrition and, you know, and tell you how to make a wagon wheel and weird things like that. I mean, it's really bizarre stuff, but memorable. It used to play endlessly. So like Family Guy has parodied it and stuff like that. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, well, it becomes, you know, it, it, it was part of the culture then. You didn't right. even think about it. It was just there, you know. It was there and you didn't know why it was. I didn't know why he was there. It's like I'm looking at this weird character when I was like 15 and just like, <laughs> what the heck is this? You know, this oddball weirdo character, you know, yeah, but so uh, they did a few of those. Yeah. I, I list them all in the book. I don't remember how many they did. And, you know, they just played over and over and over and over for but, years, you know, yeah. so everybody had them memorized, you know, um, I'm sure there's somebody out there. If you, you know, took callers or something and say, I can recite the whole thing because, you know, it's like a 30 second spot or maybe in a minute or something, you know, and it has a little tune and it's like, and all this stuff's on YouTube. So if you want to seek it out, it's all I, right. I know, I know it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, what I was surprised, about was uh you know when they put these pink panthers out i was hoping that they put maybe a few episodes of the show with the interstitial material yeah and it's not i don't think it's on any of the blu-rays no uh, I, I did push for that when i was working with greg ford mm -hmm. there is there was kind of some sort of contractual reason i i think it was kind of a little bs to be honest but you know yeah. <laughs> we couldn't get it on there that was a short answer but uh it's too bad, but, enough, but it's on youtube though and so yeah, they found enough, them well actually you can go into if you have amazon prime they actually have uh, the first season or two of the Pink Panther show with the opening uh, credits with the the Pink Panther and the inspector driving in the Panther mobile and stuff like that oh, coming wow. out of Grandma's Chinese theater. So are the uh, prints, are the prints cleaned up? I mean, is it uh, does it look they're, brand they're, new? Yeah, they're pretty good. You know, it's like yeah. uh, but uh, gotta remember um, those theatrical cartoons didn't have a laugh track on TV. NBC insisted they had to have a laugh track. So right. all the TV cartoons had a laugh track. And that was always a bone of contention when these uh, started coming out. MGM did a, a Pink Panther set right. uh, about a dozen years ago or something that's complete, but it does have some uh, cartoons with the laugh track on it. So right. Greg Ford made sure to get versions without a laugh track. And if he couldn't get one, he had to meticulously remove that laugh track wow. to have a clean copy. And he had to do that in a couple of cases. That's you know, crazy. Not him personally, but the people working with him. Right. And um so that's wild. That's <laughs> wild. What what broke down uh to Patty Freeling? Because they 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 went for years. They they did some really excellent cartoons, I thought. And yep. uh and then all of a sudden, it was just like you know, you could see they're they're running out of gas toward the end of the uh, the seventies. Yeah, and uh, yeah, God, I think um, there's the reason that's obvious, which is uh, they started doing more and more Marvel productions. So they did like Fantastic Four in the following year that was successful. Let's do Spider Woman the following year. Let's do Spider Man, and Frizz was never a fan of all that stuff. He liked the more funny animal stuff. Right. So the writing was on the wall that way. But to me, doing my research, the critical piece was in 1977, unexpectedly at lunch, uh, Frizz, uh, David DePatty, Frizz Freeling, and uh, Bob McKimson were at lunch together. Uh, Bob McKimson had a clean bill of health saying, oh, from his doctor saying, your heart's in great condition. You'll live to be 90. And he dropped it at the lunch table the next day of a heart attack. He was like, and what, six? He was in his early 60s. Like he was in his 60s, yeah, yeah, like 66 or something like that. Yeah. Totally unexpected. Um, the last series he worked on was a TV update of Mr. Magoo called What's New, Mr. Magoo? That's right. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, kinda, I remember that show fondly that, yeah. because I thought it was done pretty well, but it was done in the Hanna-Barbera. Uh, Hanna it was in the DePatty Freeling <laughs> style. Yeah. And... Uh, 
but the, the characters were pretty much on model, you know. Yeah, and they still got Jim Backus to voice him, so it, it had a connection at least that way. So, sure. Um, you know, some people hate him. I actually didn't think they were that bad. They also did the last things McKimson did was uh, Baggy Pants and the Nitwits, which Baggy Pants was a take on Charlie Chaplin, which is interesting to me because he was still alive at the time those aired, but probably was pretty elderly, so probably didn't care. But there was no lawsuits or anything. No, and the other half was the Nitwits, which were the uh, two characters that sit on the park bench and uh, Gladys hits the uh man with the purse right know, that's from laughing i guess Arnie johnson yeah. and ruth buzzy and they right. did their own voices again so you know oh, wow. it has a connection that way and and that was the last stuff mckinson worked on um everything after that pretty much was all superhero stuff uh and mckinson didn't tend to work on that stuff i mean if you look at uh over the years with the patty freeling there was pretty much two teams and there's one team that worked on all the kind of funny animal silly stuff and the other team worked on the ser- the more serious stuff so right. uh the more serious stuff didn't start off right away but then you know things came in like i said like uh you know uh, the planet of the apes and stuff like that so that was turned over to that team right and uh they had different teams even for the music there's one guy who did all the music for the sillier cartoons and one guy who did more serious music for the serious cartoons so it was it was (laughs) doug goodwin yeah he did the sillier ones he did the silly stuff but he he, what i really liked uh talking about the pink uh, not pink panthers the ant the aardvarks where he came up with this uh i call it drunken it's almost like a bunch of musicians got drunk and they're playing this music for the theme and yep. so it has a Dixieland kind of quality to it. Not saying yep. that Dixieland players are drunk, because <laughs> I mean, but there, but there's a there's a sound where it almost sounds like they're 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 having a party of some sort and playing yep. these instruments, and uh, and so it it's actually kind of neat to hear that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the Pink Panther had this, you know, this really ultra smooth, uh, sexy theme, you know. Yeah. And, uh, well, that was a combination of, uh, you know, Doug Goodwin, like you said, and also, you know, Henry Mancini, who composed the original theme. That right. da 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 Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> and then the Inspector cartoons just basically goes after it's just secret agent, you know. Yeah. Bum, bum, uh, that's bum, also bum, Henry bum, Mancini bum, theme, but yeah. Dum, 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 and that's from it. That's from yeah. Shot in the Dark, or is that from Shot in the Dark originally? And yeah. He got it. He got his own series, like I said, we said. And there's also a inspector cluzo film but alan arkin played inspector cluzo in 68 and uh, i don't think it wasn't Peter like Sellers. blake edwards didn't direct it and blake edwards didn't direct it yeah it was directed by um i forgot who directed it um uh, bud yorkin um, but the guy who dir- he was on the dick van dyke show as the neighbor and i can't think jerry paris oh he okay <laughs> yeah okay and strangely enough the guys who wrote the inspector cluzo film ended up writing the later Pink Panther f- movies for Blake Edwards. So oh. eventually over time, it all got intertwined. I guess so. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, I remember when the first one came out, I think it was Return of the Pink Panther in yeah. uh, the 70s. Yeah, and then there's Strikes and, Back and, it and just, it, Revenge. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it hit like wildfire. You know, yeah. it was a big box office grocer, and it was a funny film. And then they, it yeah. was just like they had one like every other year, it seemed like. Yeah. Uh, and then, strangely enough, those two, you know, the uh, Return of the Pink Panther and Pink Panther Strikes Again, Daddy Freeling didn't do the animation for the titles on those. Richard ironically. Williams. It was Richard Williams Richard in England. Williams, uh, yeah. But there was a, a reason for that because they were made. Uh, in England for the English market, the movies, even though, of course, we can enjoy them here. Sure. Uh, but uh, they had some strict mandate, at least on those two films, that they had to use a British animation studio, wow. which they did. That's why Richard Williams. But by the time they got to Revenge, they said, this is silly. Defatty Freeling did the animation <laughs> originally. Yeah. And so Art Leonardi took it upon himself and he did the titles for Revenge. Um, which the most memorable part of that one is, you know, the big R that drops on top of the inspector. If you remember those titles, I do <laughs> remember those titles. Yeah. So, so yeah. 
Well, Art Art is definitely is a major talent, major player with uh, De Patty Freeling, and yeah. uh, and I I think they called him the jack of all trades. So everybody had a jack of all trades. So Disney yeah. had Ken Anderson, who was a yeah. jack of all trades. He could animate, he could lay out, he could you know he could do everything. And yeah. I think Art Leonardi was just indispensable because he could do, they could put them in animation. They could put them in layout. Yeah. They could have them direct. They could, and right. he ended up doing a ton of different things, titles, right. you know? And right. so really, you know, uh, I interviewed about 15 different people at least for the book, but the two that were the most helpful that really made the book work uh, were Art Leonardi because he remembered at least at the time, everything uh, and kept everything. So, Right. <laughs> you could help me with that. The other person was Barbara Donatelli. Uh, she was head of the uh, ink and paint department, and she had every story under the sun. Some I couldn't publish, unfortunately, but <laughs> many that I could right. about what happened in that department and, you know, who came through and what happened and everything like that. She was there day to day doing all that stuff. So, right. Wow. So, well, I know, you know, just the way Art, Art Leonardi draws, he's like, he has that style. You know, you can yeah. see he, he he lives and breathes that style. So yeah. those cut paper titles he did for the uh, Ant and the Aardvark cartoons are, I always like them. I always yeah. like them. And, uh, you know, I never thought about who put this thing together. And it was yeah. his idea to do it. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing guy. And, and I worked those... with him and I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm stupid. <laughs> Oh well, you know. Uh, but if you if you do get those uh, Kino Lorber DVDs, I keep promoting them or Blu-rays. Right. Uh, th they carried over a lot of the documentaries that were on the old MGM set. In fact, I think they carried over all of them, and they produced a bunch of new ones uh, that do have new interviews uh, with uh, the surviving members. Uh, some have already passed away. Joe Syracuse did the music for a lot of these cartoons and sound effects, and yeah. he passed away recently. He was in oh, his late terrible. 90s, so yeah. Wow. Um, but, well, art's, uh, art's up there too, isn't he? Art's, art's in his 90s now, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, um, yeah, I gotta get him on uh, here. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I haven't talked to him for a while. Last time he was, he was, he was uh, still doing well. Um, oh yeah. Now to answer your question, I guess I was wrapping it up um, with that, what happened with the Patty Freeling. And so, yeah, like I said, Bob and Kinson died. Um, and uh, they were veering more and more into superheroes because Marvel Comics at the time was still headed by Stan Lee, but Stan Lee wasn't really running the comic books. He just had his name on the masthead, just Stan Lee presents. But Lee was like becoming more like a Walt Disney. He wanted more uh, and you know more to do with movies and less to do with these comics and so right. he moved out to hollywood and uh, you know uh you know he worked with the patty freeling on the fantastic four show that's the one with herbie the robot <laughs> um a lot of people complained about that but there is like some reason why they couldn't use human torch there's two reasons mentioned one is human torch was leased out to somebody else so they didn't have the rights to it other people have said and we don't know which one's correct that kids would light themselves on fire if they saw the human torch that's probably more like it yeah so yeah because anything that can be imitated why they had a herbie the robot also star wars was popular by that point so let's have a robot instead of a flaming kid you know <laughs> anyway so yeah because um, you don't want kids setting themselves on fire throughout america right you know? so like i said the the th that went through spider woman went through <laughs> and then they were working on spider-man um Chris Freeling was the older of the two uh, mm -hmm. and he was getting up in years and he said, I don't really need to do this anymore. And so uh, he and Depart uh, David DePatty parted ways. Uh, you know, it was a pretty amicable split and uh, Frizz Freeling went on to do Looney Tunes things again, uh, like uh, directing things like those compilation films, like the Looney, Looney, Looney Bugs Bunny movie. <laughs> Right. Um, and he actually did one more Pink Panther series in the 80s, but it was Pink Panther and Sons for Hanna-Barbera. Right. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, he did just a few more Looney Tunes projects and then just retired. Right. Whereas to Patty, being significantly younger, uh, he uh, they sold the studio to Marvel. It became Marvel Productions. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a slow start, they had their Spider-Man show, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And then they had a couple 
ones that really seem like the Patty Freeling show. I don't know if you remember them called Meatballs and Spaghetti and one called Pandemonium with some pandas and things like that. Mm -hmm. They did okay. They lasted a year. Um, But then Marvel Productions started going into the day-to-day market. And uh, then they produced like the afternoon block of like G.I. Joe and things like that and Muppet Babies and stuff like that. Those hit the big time for them and so that's what they're known for people like art leonardi and all those people they just stayed on for the ride and they continue to work on for the better part of the 80s into the 90s and then that studio split off and and everything to patty retired and now in the back of my to patty freeling book and this is with the help of jerry beck we had to ascertain who owns what (laughs) because (laughs) not one person owns all the properties um of the patty freeling um right. as, at the time of writing all the pink panther theatricals and all those associated ones steel wanted toads and everything owned by mgm mm-hmm. uh anything that was by, by dr seuss went back to dr seuss uh planet of the apes was 20th century fox of course that's now owned by disney but at the time it was still separate mm-hmm. uh and you can go through all the marvel stuff went to marvel you know and everything like that so wow um and so you can't really reconstruct a studio out of it, but that, but uh, that's kind of what happened. It, it just kind of carried on as Marvel Productions, and then kind of just petered off as David DePatty retired, and then he just died this last year. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, he was, so. uh, yeah, not too long ago, mm-hmm. not too long ago. It's it's sad. Uh, they did some great work. Mm-hmm. You know, DePatty Freeling. I think the heyday, pretty much. Between 1964 and 1974, that's kind of like what I think is their heyday. And then basically yeah. it just started falling apart. But, you know, but uh, they gave us some good cartoons. They kept uh, cartoons going. And mm-hmm. uh, and I uh, what I found very interesting was uh, in New York here, uh, we would see the Saturday morning, the Pink Panther show. Mm-hmm. And then it became the Pink Panther and a half uh, I think an oh, yes. hour and a half show. I mean, they kept yeah, laugh and a half hour, laugh and a half yeah, hour. I mean, they kept season. changing it. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I, I guess they, every year they felt like they needed to change the name yeah. and the length of the show. I think at one point right. it was uh, uh, was it the longest an hour and a half or was it two yeah, hours? Yeah, was that one. Yeah, that was yeah. the longest one. Most yeah. of them were a half hour, and they had a version that promoted the Aardvark, and uh, the last version was called the new the all new pink panther show right which was not on nbc most of strangely enough most of the patty freeling shows ended up on nbc right if you didn't but most mm-hmm. did um then i guess nbc at that point thought pink panther had run its course been on for like 10 years almost so yeah. uh abc got the all new pink panther show and that version had the last ones they were made for tv but they ended up being theatrical too and that had the crazy like craig cartoons too right so yeah <laughs> and i i don't think they picked it up i think it was on for one season it was just one season and yeah. then they dropped because the cartoons were pretty poor yeah, kind of. Pink Panthers are okay, but you know when you compare them to the earlier ones, they're pretty weak. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, you know, yeah. you get into a formula, and it's almost like those Casper cartoons, you know, yeah. um, where it's like you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all, and yeah. they manage to keep it fresh for those initial maybe five years, and then, but you know, you know, after a while, they they kind of start repeating what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I understand that. I mean, they tried, you know? Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say was when these shows were on uh, NBC, I just remember, I don't remember ever seeing The Inspector. Um, and, and well, actually, I, I do, but I used to turn, I used to turn the channel off because <laughs> I didn't uh-huh. think they were, I didn't think they were very funny at the time mm-hmm. or I'd just get up and, you know get something to drink or whatever. Then I'd come back and then, you know, it'd be another Pink Panther on. But I like the Ant and the Yardvarks, but I don't remember any of the, the, um, I remember the Tijuana Toads only through theatricals. I saw them in theatricals and uh, some of the other stuff. I I don't remember it being part of that uh, hour. It it wasn't. I mean, the longest version of the show, the laugh and a half, hour and a half one, 
uh, that was when they called them the Texas toads. So those ended up there the first time. Right. And uh, they did a new feature that wasn't theatrical at all, but it was made for TV. And they put it as part of the show called Mr. Jaw. It's a takeoff on Jaws. I remember it wasn't, that. Yeah. It wasn't Jabber Jaw. That was over at Hanna Barbera. Well, uh, Mr. Jaw had a top hat and he spoke. Uh, it was Artie Johnson again speaking with the German accent, right? You know, like you know, <laughs> which which so. actually I still I found it better than Jab- Jabberjaw was uh, Joe Besser, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was uh, Frank Welker doing Curly. Oh, three okay. Stages. Yeah, so okay. it is a whoop whoop whoop. Yeah, yeah but uh, Mr. Jaw, yeah, it was you know like this, you know, like a very interesting that type of sound, you know, and then right. he had uh, a catfish named Catfish who was voiced by Arnold Stang, who basically does typical voice that he does you know for most of his characters you know yeah um wow and you know there's there's moments on this mr draw one they made a lot of them that's i think the problem with that if they had kept it under like about 10 or 15 cartoons but they made like 40 of them or something oh my god in a very short period of time yeah because they only made 17 ant in the aardvarks you know yeah yeah uh, it's crazy and, uh, yeah the only ones that they went more than 17 or the theatrical market were the Pink Panthers. Right. Everything else was that magic number 17. So I figured 17 is enough. Let's do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, well, look, the, the book is think pink, correct? Think pink, the Depetty Freeling story. Yes. And, uh, (laughs) that's available on Amazon. Is it available anywhere else or just Amazon? Uh, available good? on uh, barnesandnoble.com. You can order it through the store or um, you can also order it directly through Bear Manor Media. Uh, sometimes they have uh, discounts if you order directly through them. So, you know, you might want to consider that. <laughs> and all your other books are available on Amazon too. So the, yep, uh, the yep. ones we mentioned, Total Television Cartoons, you have a mm-hmm. companion to that, which... Uh, Looks pretty interesting. The Alvin the story of the Ross Bagdasarian uh, senior mm-hmm. and uh, Frozen and Ice, which I, I want to have you back for that because that okay. should be interesting. Because <laughs> I have a feeling it's not going to be talking too much about the animated film. It's going to be talking about the live action. Only the ones that were made during that period is 67, 66 to 85, you know. <laughs> anyway, Mark Arnold, thank you for uh, joining us and talking about the Patty Freeling cartoons. Great. Okay. <laughs> Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks, you too. <laughs> Do you have any questions or comments about the podcast? Please email Brian at cartoonerific.com. Your email may be featured in one of our future shows. Hey. Anyway, thank you, Mark Arnold, for uh, coming on our show today and talking about the DePatty Freeling Studio. I uh, hope to have Mark back real real soon talk about uh uh total tv cartoons and ross bagdasarian and alvin and the chipmunks and a whole bunch of other stuff uh if you'd like to buy mark's book think pink the story of to patty freeling uh you can do that by going to amazon.com he has a whole bunch of other books on there um about different subjects uh like total tv cartoons and alvin and the chipmunks So uh, please check that out. Next week, we're going to do a show that's near and dear to my heart, because before I got into being an animator, I was a fan, uh, just like every kid out there. And uh, so I really, uh, I discovered animation art pretty early and uh, was buying animation art before it was really fashionable. It's kind of a thing now. Uh, So we're going to be talking about the history of that. We're going to be talking about the history of collecting animation art and what studios were selling their art, uh, making it available to the public and uh, and how it had some major renaissance back in the 70s, uh, collecting animation art and uh, where it is today. Our guest is going to be uh, Miss Debbie Weiss. She is the owner and operator of the wonderful World of Animation Art Gallery in sunny California. And she'll be on. We'll have a a nice discussion with her. Uh, If you really like what you're listening to, please subscribe or tell a friend. And uh, telling a friend, that's the highest form of compliment for us. Basically says you like it. And I think uh, your friend would like it. And so when you say that, that's uh, that's really uh, uh, a one 
two thumbs up thing. And if I had two more thumbs, I'd give it four thumbs up, uh, according to a friend. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's very important to us. We're available on a bunch of different services. We're available on Amazon. We're available on Google. We're on uh, Apple, Spotify. Trying to think of all the other ones. There's so many, so many others. We're just not available on Pandora yet or Sirius XM. Uh, we're working on that. We'll let you know when that's available. If you go on Alexa and try to listen to us, you may have a little bit of a problem because Cartoonerific is kind of a made-up name, and it's our made-up name, and it's how we identify ourselves. But unfortunately, uh, when Amazon or Alexa, I should say, if you go on Alexa and you're trying to... Uh, listen to our podcast that way and you say let me listen to the cartoonerific podcast uh it may s- misread it as terrific cartoon or something and it may not come up so the best way and this was actually according to a, a friend out here in long island uh he said to me you know it, it won't come up cartoonerific but if you say classic animated cartoon podcast with brian mitchell most likely it will come up because it did for him so try that. Uh, anyway, I just want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, we have great shows coming up, and so I'm very excited about that. Uh, Willie Ito is coming up in a couple of weeks, and that will be a two-part episode. And he is uh, a great artist, and he was a great interview. So uh, I know you're going to enjoy that. Anyway, I want everybody to have a great day. I want you to have an even better week. And... We hope to see you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. The Cartoonerific Podcast is copyright 2024 by Cartoonerific Studios Incorporated. All rights reserved.